About eight years ago, at the beginning of the personal shift into what I call my unorthodox Christianity, I decided to do something that physicists often do to help understand or sort through their ideas. It's a game of mental what-if that physicists call the thought experiment. But my thought experiment was intended to help me work out some metaphysical questions I had. I posed myself a straightforward problem. If I were God, and wanting to create the reality that I have known all my life, what I often call the theater of experience, what would the ingredients, the basic building blocks of that reality be? What elements would need to exist to fashion a universe in which all the experiences from my memories could take place? Very quickly, I came up with a short list of six things which I've illustrated in this picture. Space, time, matter, energy, mind, and spirit. Having studied physics, I could see as soon as I finished this list that it could be simplified. One of the most important ideas from Einstein's theory of relativity is that space and time are not actually separate and distinct from one another, but rather different manifestations of the same thing, which scientists have given the name space-time. So my list shrank to five things. Space-time, matter, energy, mind, and spirit. But just as quickly, I saw more simplification was possible. Einstein had also given us E equals mc squared, which is the formula for the matter-energy equivalence. Matter and energy are also not as separate and distinct from one another as they seem, and could be transformed from one into the other. I couldn't think of a cozy word to combine matter and energy the way science had done with space-time, so I merged these two things using the word substance. Now my list had just four items. Space-time, substance, mind, and spirit. At this point, I got excited by the way pairs of items in the list were merging, so I looked at the last two items to see if there was a way they might also be different manifestations of the same thing. And very soon, it came to me that both mind and spirit were different expressions of consciousness. Now my list had just three things needed to create the universe. Space-time, substance, and consciousness. At this point, I thought that it would be amazing if there was a way in which the three things left in the list would combine into a single thing, one singular essence from which all of our known reality could be fashioned. I sat there racking my brain for a concept that would encompass these three things. That was when I had a sudden moment of revelation. Out of nowhere, it occurred to me that the thing I was seeking was already in the list. Consciousness. As soon as that thought entered my mind, I had a knee-jerk reaction against it. How could things as observable, as tangible, as quantifiable and measurable as space and time and matter and energy exist as expressions of something that had no known form, was not directly observable, and could not be in any meaningful way measured? That was when another revelation took place. Of course it was possible. The how of it became obvious at once. The blending I was looking for takes place in one of the most mundane and common of human experiences, in dreams. Every night, while we dream, we have the experience of being in a reality that seems to have both space and time, filled with people and things made of both matter and energy, and yet, when we awaken, we recognize that all the seemingly real space and time and matter and energy are nothing but illusions woven purely out of the fabric of our own consciousness. We create universes when we dream. If these things had the feeling of reality while we dreamed, why wouldn't that also be true of our waking reality? What reason is there to believe that all we take for granted as real is not actually woven out of another consciousness? a larger consciousness than any we possess, a consciousness so vast and powerful that it sustains a dream with untold billions, perhaps trillions of created characters and a universe of apparent infinite size and complexity. The mind of God. Creation from nothing? Why not? We do it every night, several times a night. And not only do we create space-time and substance in our own dreams, we fill it with created characters that owe their existence entirely to the background field of our own consciousness. 
and suddenly, seeing from this point of view a number of things in my spiritual beliefs began to make sense. Seen this way, space-time is one dimension of existence. Substance, or matter and energy, is another dimension. Intersecting, these two metaphysical dimensions form the material plane of our physical reality. And this material plane is just a thin slice within the larger geometry of divine space formed by the depth inside the dreaming consciousness of God. To me, while the universe exists within God, and therefore God is present at every place and in every moment in our universe, the boundaries of God extend well past the boundaries of the physical universe. While some people believe the universe is God, I believe there is more to God than just the material universe. The manner in which I conceive God is called panentheism, a belief that while God permeates all of the universe, the universe is contained within God. There are many differing and overlapping perspectives on the nature of consciousness. I think it's fair to say that most people who take a position in the discussion believe there are various qualities of consciousness. One is awareness, both of oneself and of the relationship between self and surroundings, of other people and of the environment. Another quality is the ability to process experience, in the past as memory, in the present as response to stimuli, and in the future as anticipation and expectation. These are all important and interesting elements to consider, but the central question about consciousness that is most compelling to me is what produces consciousness. What is its source? There are people who believe that what we call consciousness is little more than a curious side effect of our biology. This belief, called materialism, says that electrical impulses in the nervous system, affected by chemical composition and reaction, results in the phenomenon we call consciousness. This isn't a belief to which I subscribe, because of the implication that when our body dies and its electrochemical processes stop, so does our consciousness. I can't accept that. And materialism also gets dangerously close to an endorsement of determinism in which everything we think and feel can be reduced to simple physical processes and in which there is no free will. I believe in free will. While the nervous system provides a kind of interface between consciousness and the theater of experience, the origin of consciousness is something I believe that exists outside physical reality as we understand it. As Wayne Dyer likes to say, science has found the command centers in the brain, but not the commander. I believe that it is consciousness that creates matter and energy, not matter and energy that creates consciousness. Certainly, what happens in the physical world as well as to our bodies impacts the flow of experience into our consciousness as well as how effectively we operate in the physical world. But I am certain that I am not my body. The essence of a human being is eternal. I believe what is meant by we are not human beings having spiritual experiences, we are spiritual beings having human experiences. I'm sure many of you have experienced supernatural abilities when you dream. The most common of these is the ability to fly. When the reality you occupy is created from your own consciousness, the universe you create does anything your imagination can conceive. The most potent demonstration of this is in the phenomenon we call lucid dreaming. In a lucid dream, you are fully aware of being in a dream and can often take conscious control over the conditions of the dream. When you are fully aware that you are both the dream as well as the dreamer, anything is possible. If the universe we take as reality is a dream unfolding in the mind of God, then couldn't God also inhabit that character as a dream, but unlike the rest of us, engaged in lucid dreaming? Suddenly, the miracles attributed to Jesus Christ not only seem plausible, but understandable. Aware in a lucid fashion of being both the dream and the dreamer, Christ could easily have the ability to take control of any aspect of the dream and bend the behavior of reality to his will. The belief that human beings manifest what we think about is emerging in the messages of a number of contemporary teachers. The aphorism that thoughts become things is one of the most important elements in the widely popular book The Secret and is the central idea in The Law of Attraction. Wayne Dyer often reminds us that as you think, so shall you be, or that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at start to change. Even though this message is finding its way into the messages of many modern spiritual teachers, 
It's also an idea that can be found in long-established spiritual traditions. Buddha said, We are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world. In the book of Mark, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. If indeed the physical universe is an illusion, a dreamt manifestation arising from divine consciousness, the very same divine consciousness from which we are created and to which we remain connected, then the energy of our thoughts have the potential to change the shape of the dream, to change the material illusion we call reality. What remains to be explored are the details of the bridging concepts between these long-held spiritual ideas and the workings of the physical universe. Quantum mechanics has already suggested that human consciousness affects the outcome of physical systems it observes. I believe that not only is God within all of us, but because God permeates every part of the reality in which we exist, but also through that divine birthright, the power of God rests within each of us to reshape reality, not just in a metaphorical or philosophical way, but in very concrete and tangible ways, within each of us individually, and within the whole of the human race, part of a grand evolutionary journey toward enlightenment and the full awakening of Christ consciousness. I'd love to know what you think about this video. You can write me on the email address at the screen. My thanks to God for this chance to share with you, and may the gifts of love, joy, peace, and enlightenment come to you all.